let's uh, see what we will, you will find in the, in the new release. So it's just uh, a few set of features, because we have many features. So the reason why it's not 6.1, but 7. And uh, so I'm going to go through different features now and start with uh, data clustering, because we work a lot on this. You won't get the and uh, so just a few remarks about uh, data clustering. So remember, this is for creating a latent variable, right? And when we create this latent variable, it can be just for trying to find groups of observations, rows that look the same, right? So this is usually what we are doing in market research. But it can also be for trying to find groups of observations that behave the same, and then this is slightly different. Or just to try to represent the hidden value. So we see that we are not able to observe and we are going to try to construct this hidden value. It can also be used for summarizing a group of variables, a set of variables. And the last one is we can interpret this latent variable as a compact representation of the joint priority distribution that is represented by this uh, value. So these are the objectives. And here, perhaps Francois, you recognize that, right? <laughs> Fabien, non Francois, yeah. Fabien, bon. which one? I don't remember. You remember this one, right? So, this is something we did with you in uh, 2005 or so. Uh, so, this is one of the results you can have when you do uh, clustering in market research, trying to find a group of customers that look the same here, right? Here. And then, once you have identified this group, you can have a specific uh, marketing policy for each group. Right? So when we have, uh, when we are doing data clustering, we need to find a way to evaluate the quality of this cluster. And we have some technical quality, like uh, the homogeneity of the cluster, or the purity, if you will. Uh, we need also to find something, some clusters that are easy to discriminate, so we need to be able to find uh, clear differences between this cluster. And we also need to have stable solutions. And from the functional point of view, you have to, to have clusters that are easy to understand. We need to, yes, not to struggle to find the picture you know, that you are going to associate with your cluster. And it should also be operational, obviously. So these are the quality. And now a few words about the algorithm we are using so far. So this is based on the naive architecture. So where you have in the center here the factor. And this factor is a hidden value. So you have states. This is something we are looking for too, because we don't know how many states this is absolutely hidden. This is really like having a variable in your data set with 100% of missing value. So we don't have lots of opportunities. We just can build this kind of naive structure, connect this hidden variable with all the manifest. And we are going to start randomly by setting marginal distribution for factor zero and also marginal condition distribution for the manifest. Once we have this structure, we are using an expectation maximization algorithm, right? Just to try to convert very quickly to a solution. And we are doing lots of strides in order to, to find the best one. And for selecting the best one, we have a score that we slightly change uh, during this version that is just now based on the entropy of the data given this naive structure. And we have also a heuristic search algorithm to try to find how many states you need. So you define a mean, you define a max, and based on the score, we are going to try to find the optimal one. So this is what you have, right? Uh, now, in order to improve, I, I think that one of the quality of the clustering is the stability. So in order to improve this, uh, we have developed what we call the meta clustering, which is indeed a way to summarize the best solution. So you remember, one of the objectives of clustering is to do summary or to summarize data, so we can use clustering on the solution we have found in order to improve and, uh, the stability. So this is what we have now. If you select this option, you are going to generate lots of solutions. So this is a second layer here, this one. So each of these nodes is a hidden value we have created. And then we are clustering this solution. Right. So this will create a much more stable solution. So this is uh, the this was the meta cluster, right? Uh, for now, this is multi-net. This approach has been designed for our friend from PNG, and this is for trying to find 
uh, observations that looked at the head sensor. Right? So uh, the idea in that case is to to build not a naive structure because it's not yet naive is just for uh, looking the same, right? So for behaving, we need some connection between the manifest because with a naive structure, we are assuming that given, if we know the, the cluster, then all the manifests are independent. So this is not the behavior here. So we need to find a way to, to add connection between this naive, uh, between this manifest dialogue, and we are going to create a kind of augmented naive network. And then we have created a new algorithm, which is a I'm used to say it's EM square, so it's an EM EM algorithm. So in blue, you have the maximization and expectation that we are using by using a subset of networks. So we start with the classical expectation phase with naive, and based on that, we are maximizing by using one network per cluster. So this is like creating, you know, lots of. If you have five clusters, you are going to create five different unsupervised networks. And with these networks, we are going through the expectation expectation phase again that will allow us to, to change the cluster of some observation. And we will conclude with the maximization phase with the resonate. And this is so we mix between look and behavior. And obviously, you have two parameters that will allow you to, to change this mix. So we also work on uh, the heterogeneity. Right? So this is. Uh, when we want to, 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 there is something, we have a hypothesis where there is a hidden Bible that uh, screw everything, right? So you have this Bible, and then when you look at the mutual information, there is nothing or almost nothing. And then we're going to try to create this latent Bible in order to maximize the mutual information of the Bible. So we have now an, what we call an heterogeneity index that we have integrated in the score. And this index will measure the mutual information we have with all the manifest variables and the target node. So this will be our objective, will be to find clusters that will allow us to increase the sum of all the mutual information across the different uh, factors. So this is an example of what we can have. So this, I guess you are familiar with this, with this graph. So you have, uh, this is it's too strong. Not easy, crazy. Yeah, so you have here uh, the box is the mutual information you have when you are taking the entire data set. And these ranges are what you can have across all the clusters. Right? So you see that the dots here are always at the bottom, which means that when we are splitting the data, one data set per cluster, in each of these subsets, we are increasing the mutual information of the target. Then, another type of clustering. This is a variable clustering. I guess lots of people here have used that. So now the idea is not to cluster the observation, but to cluster the variable, the columns. And the idea behind that is to see that if we have strong connection between these nodes, there is probably a hidden concept that explains this uh, strong relationship. So this is an example of uh, viral clustering. So we always need to start with the Bayesian network that represent the joint particle solution. Uh, one of the key points is also to use that on a network that is not too strongly connected. We don't want to use that on the back of nodes, right? So we, we need to have a, a clear layout like this one. And then by analyzing the strengths of the connection, we are grouping the nodes together. So it's a hierarchical Bayesian network, uh, hierarchical clustering algorithm, right? That is using the Kubak Lider as a distance. So we are using the strengths of the connection in order to, to group uh, the nodes. So we we are using the uh, version 6 to stop criteria. The first one is a threshold, the Kubak Lambert's threshold, under which we are not grouping the nodes anymore. And uh, there is another one, which is well, the first one is quite sensitive, so you don't have to change it because it has been carefully chosen. But the other one is much more subjective, right? So I have used five during 10 years, perhaps. So this is how many mark, variable max you want to have per cluster. But I know that our friend from PNG are using seven since, since I think seven or eight years now, 
and it's also working nicely, at least on your data set. So this is something that you have to, to, to define before start. And uh, what we have done to improve value clustering is to, to define now post-processing of the leaf nodes. Because by construction, this is what we have without post-processing. When you have this kind of naive structure in your network, so here it's just naive, but you can have this kind of flowers in your network, it's, it's a big network. And here by construction, if I define five vinyl per cluster max, I'm going to create this pink cluster. And then all the other nodes will become orphans. And then there will be one cluster per node, which is not good. Right? So in order to reduce this problem, we have this uh, post-processing, where the idea is to create a kind of hub for this guy. Right? So we have, still have the pink cluster, but then instead of having the, the, the orphan alone, we are like, it's not really duplicating, but this is more or less the idea. We are creating a hub for the, 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 the one in the center that will still make the connection between the, the orphans. And then we'll be able to cluster these nodes too. Okay, so this will increase the quality of the cluster rate and uh, increase the decrease the idea of the number of cluster. Okay, now let's talk about, well, you see some formula here, but it's just because uh, in this release we work a lot on, uh, we change a lot of, of menu items and also some metrics, mostly the name, but you see that we introduced some additional metrics. And uh, now we are talking about log loss. So each time you have a minus binary logarithm of your probability, so I was calling that you know, years and years and minus binary logarithm of the price, which was a pain in the ass. But now, this is a log loss, right? And this is probably. So you have the log loss that is defined by this problem. Here, this is how this log loss is changing with respect to the probability. So if you have a probability of one, which is then something that is certain, low uncertainty, you don't have any log loss. If you have zero, you have a log loss equal to the infinity. So this is directly uh, the information theory. Right? So now that we have the log loss, this was the log loss for one message. Right? So when you have a, a random variable, you have at least two messages. Right? So there's a positive one and the negative one. So when we uh, have a probability like that, we can compute the expected log loss, which is the probability of the message, of the state, if you will, time, uh, the binary logarithm of the, this project. So this is the expected log loss. And then we can redefine the entropy as being just the sum of all these log loss, or expected log loss. Right, so now the entropy is defined like that. This is kind of interesting here. So you see, I, I think you are used to see this square. So this is the entropy. And remember that the entropy reach is maximum when the probability is uniform. So when you have lots of uncertainty, your entropy is at its maximum value. This is the reason why we say that entropy is used for measuring the uncertainty you have. And in blue and red, these are the expected block losses of the two messages. So we were naively thinking before having this curve that the max was equal to 0.5, uh, but it's not equal to 0.5 because 0.5 is here. So you will have a max at 0.57, something like that, which is indeed uh, correspond to the binary logarithm of 1 uh, divided by E. So this blue and red curve are the expected log loss of the two messages that made that are making uh, the random value. Now that we have this matrix, we have also in, uh, added a, a feature in the monitor, you can directly see this expected log loss. So in this one for DIPMEA, you have the expected log loss for yes and the one for no. Right, so these are not probabilities, just expected log loss. And you have the expected uh, the, the probability solution for wrong cases. And if we set, this is just a kind of strange example, if you set yes to wrong cases here, you can see that even though we are changing the probability solution for DIPMEA, uh, the, the expected block loss for no does not change. So this is just for fun. 
Yo, everybody's smiling with that, right? This is quite interesting. <laughs> so you can now switch uh, and use that in your model. So another thing is uh, that the maximum value of the entropy, so you have seen that the max was uh, when it was uh, uniformly distributed. The maximum value of the entropy depends on the number of states of your value, right? So if you have just two states, the maximum value of the entropy is just one. If you have four states, it's equal to two. If you have eight, to three, right? So if you want to compare entropy, we can just use the absolute value. So we have introduced here the normalized entropy. So we are dividing the entropy by the binary logarithm of Sx, which is the number of states. So with this way, you can compare entropy with values that do not have the same number of states. This is a representation with a diagram where you have uh, the mutual information. So you have the entropy in blue for x, entropy of, in red or pink, I don't know, uh, even my color blindness has my colleague here. What, what which color do you see? Pink. Pink? Is it pink? Okay. <laughs> and in the middle, you have the mutual information. So this is the overlap between these two, uh, two entropies. We have also created uh, the normalized mutual information. Right? So we are dividing the uh, mutual information by the binary logarithm of Sx, of x. And we have also a symmetric normalized mutual information, which is taking into account binary logarithm of x and y. You have, so this is important because this related mutual information was called before normalized mutual information. So you have to be careful in the report now. Right? But I think it's more of coherent now. So this one we already had it before, but again it was called normalized mutual information. And we have slightly changed also the formula of the symmetric related mutual information. That was the symmetric normalized mutual information. By using this uh, square root of the entropy of x and y, because then this is the same thing or the same way of computing the Pearson correlation. Where the entropy is a, is a covariance and uh, the image information is a covariance and uh, the entropy is a variance. This is, uh, I don't know if you are used to use this tool, this is the tool that we are using for measuring the quality of the network for representing your data. Right? So, after, uh, when was that? I think it was two months ago I did a training, mm -hmm. and as usual, I'm always learning during the training. And I had a guy, an accountant, who told me, but here you have the log loss, and oh, it was not the log loss, I operated the program in the And you are computing the mean for that. So is it not the entropy? I say, okay, so it is indeed the entropy. So now, this, if you make the average of, of this density, you have the empirical column entropy of your data. So this is the name that you have then the normalized entropy, which is the same thing that divided by Sx, where x here is the size or oh, is yes, the, the set of bios. So this is indeed the size of the hypercube. We have also renamed what I think you call that the consistency. I don't know if you had the exact same definition in mind before. But now, uh, what was called before consistency slash conflict, because we never know how to call it, is now called compression. So the compression is just here, the difference between the log loss with uh, your, your with the, what we call the straw model, which is usually the fully unconnected uh, network, and the log loss you have with your uh, Bayesian network. This for all the observations. So we have this. Nice here to compare uh, the entropy you have in pink with a fully unconnected network and in blue uh, with the network you, you are currently evaluating. And then we have also the, the mean compression. Right? So now let's talk about uh, resampling, which is also renaming because before it was under cross validation. So I guess we will be slightly lost during a few minutes with the app 7. Uh, and it was called cross-validation, but we had then lots of different stuff. So 
which was, I think, much better to, to, to restart from scratch. So resampling, you know, can be used for two objectives. Either you want to measure the viability of your estimation. So in that case, you can use a jackknife, at least we had, we had it before. You can use a data perturbation, you know, the, when we are adding uh, weight, random weight uh, to, the, to the row. And we have added the bootstrap. So if you want, data perturbation is a kind of smooth bootstrap or soft bootstrap. And bootstrap is just you know, something with replacement, which is shake a lot, so it's a little. And the second objective of resampling is to use uh, resampling for trying to evaluate the quality of your settings. Right? Either the discretization you have chosen, or the discretization you have chosen, or you know the number of states, or the learning algorithm. So you are going to use K4 for the whole control. So this is now in this form. And we have four types of analysis with this resampling. Uh, the first one is R confidence, so when you want to, to measure the stability of your, of your connections. We have the same thing for viable clustering, so to, to evaluate the stability of your cluster solutions. We have that for the target evaluation, you know, for precision, reliability, and things like that, for care, gene index. And we have also added the multi target. Uh, evaluation where we have all these metrics per node. So again, we can do the something with a multi target. And uh, we have also worked a lot of science to the election. Uh, we had so many talks, right? So we were you know, just listening to the radio and we were saying, well, with 999 people, we have this confidence level. Uh, so it was, it, it was also a very frequent question during the, the training. So we have now a way to take into account uh, the number of observations per, uh, per cell in that data. Uh, indeed, you know, we are using the maximum likelihood estimation when we are estimating the probability. So this is a highly frequentist way to estimate the probability. So this is the example, if you have two nodes, X and Y, you need to estimate the margin of the solution for x and the conditional for y. And for that, this very simple formula where we are using the occurrences, how many times I have xi in my data set divided by the size of this data set. And same thing uh, for the conditional uh, one per one per term, yeah. your state of the pair. So this is uh, the MLE. And uh, it's kind of obvious, but if you have 10% in a cell, you will not have the same confidence if you use 100 samples or 10,000. Right. So this is the idea here, is to, to try to measure this uncertainty. And for that, we are using, so something you probably know a lot here, uh, this very classical way. So if we use a confidence level of 95%, we're going to use this 1.96 coefficient in order to define the left and right bound. Right? So then we have a range per probability. So we are going to do that for all the probabilities we have estimated. So when you are talking about an election, you just have usually one or two. Right? Here this would be if you, you can have thousands of these confidence intervals in your network. Right? This is a way to, to see these, uh, these uh, intervals. So you, have, you can generate a report, and then you will see uh, the plus minus here indicates uh, how the priority can vary uh, in this interval. So, and this is color coded because if you have less than five samples, five samples, this is a particular number, it's in red and it's green for total. So once we have this confidence chart, so we can have the report, which is quite useful, but at the end of the day, it, it's still better to, to, to simulate things. So we are using Monte Carlo in order to generate thousands of networks by sampling in each confidence interval. And this will allow us to generate this kind of curve. So here you have the confidence interval of each state. So this is for one variable that has three states here. So we can see the mean, the max, and the maximum priority. And obviously, 
we can go further and do the same thing with the mean value, with the mutual information, normalized mutual information, and the related mutual information. We do not have yet total effect and direct effect because this is kind of expensive to compute, but perhaps in the near future we are going to have So this is a result for uh, the, mutual, the related mutual information. Then we have also work on optimization. So we have three optimization algorithms that are available, right? So we have the greedy search, which was previously called dynamic profile, and was not in the optimization, was in a report uh, analysis. Uh, we have a tree, which is a kind of generalization of this greedy search, because greedy is just one step ahead. Here, we are searching by excluding some drivers, right? And we also have a genetic algorithm, which is a much more comprehensive search. So we have these three types of algorithm, and we can use them for optimizing the target node. So this is what we have since 15 years. And since a few months, we have also the possibility to optimize a function node. So I don't know if everybody is familiar with function nodes. So this is a, something we have introduced in version 6. And that allows to directly create, so it's not a, a node of a Bayesian level, it's a node that summarizes a joint priority distribution. So, with this node, you can compute the entropy of a set of nodes. You can compute what is the maximum probability of one state. What is, so, you can really, it's like having a small API, if you will. You can already use the result of inference and use it inside your network. A function node can be just a child or can be a parent. So you can use the entropy to define your probability solution. So there are lots of degrees of freedom with that. And thanks to that, as you can optimize your function node, you can really define, use it for defining your own objective function. Because before, in our genetic algorithm, uh, we had to predefine an objective function, a fitness function. So now with that, you have all the degrees of freedom you want. You can try to optimize in order to maximize the entropy of your network if you want. I don't know why you would do it. Oh, Stefan, you did that, right, for your sound system. So this can be something to help. And uh, so this is just a detail, but you can also select a subset of nodes and do just the genetic optimization based on this set of nodes. And the last point, something we have just added a few weeks ago for Carnegie Mellon. Uh, it's just uh, an option that allows you to save all the solutions that have been generated. So this way you can try to estimate uh, the response surface. So now let's go switch to some nice thing. Well, my graphical, if you will. Uh, we have integrated also a module for geographic information. So when you have a data set, when your network comes with uh, coordinates, so latitude and longitude, you can now visualize the object on a map. So we have, so we are going to have one object per observation. It's more or less like batch inference, if you will, in the middle. And we have four dimensions we, we can use. We can change the shape. So we have a subset of shapes that are available. We can change the color. We can change the size and we can change the opacity of the object. Which means that here, you can use four different variables. Right? So you don't have to use only one. So you can use one for the shape, another one for the color, and so on. There is also some things that is interesting, that it can be either fixed, so you can decide to fix the value of the shape or the color of the opacity, or you can read the value in your data set. So use the actual value for that, or you can use the value that is inferred by the Bayesian level. Right, so you have these three degrees of freedom. So this is an example for Feynman. Feynman, are you still with me? Yeah. So you will recognize, perhaps you will see your house here. Uh, so here in this map, so we are in Seattle, and you can, I have decided to define the shape based on, so this is data set with houses and prices, so, so I don't know. If the number of garages are <laughs> in, this, in this data set as well. So here I'm using the grade of the house to define the shape. 
If we have triangle, we have circle, we have square. I'm using uh, the living room area to define the size of the object. I'm using the color, uh, the, the, the price for defining the color. So when it's red, it's expensive. And here we have the opacity that is based on the certainty. So I've used uh, the, the, the entropy in order to define uh, the, the opacity of the object. Okay, so if it's if it's really solid, so I'm quite certain of my inference rule. And from there, we have also now, you, I guess we are used to use uh, the mapping function so that was in two dimensions before. So now you have a third dimension. So this is exactly the same tool. So you have the exact same metrics to, to, to use for your analysis, but just in, in a nicer way. Right? So here, this is the visualization of your Bayesian network. So just within the graph pane of Bayesian app. If you use a 2D mapping, so here I use the size of the node is based on the force of these nodes. You have the thickness of the link depending on the kubak libel divergence. And uh, the colors are just based on the classical of, of clustering, right? And the same thing in 3D will be like that. So you have this tool available, and then with your mouse, you can really do rotation on what you want. But it, Indeed, at the end of the day, the objective was not to design this. It was just a way to be able to generate an XML file. Right. We have also defined, uh, you, we are using the temporal indices to define layers. Right. So this way, if I have this kind of probabilistic structural equation model, right, so where we have the manifest variable and the factors here, if I define a temporal index different from the manifest and uh, for the factor, I can generate automatically this kind of graph. So here, this is a perfect illustration of this hierarchical Bayesian network, where you have the manifest variable in the first layer, you have the factor in the second one, and my target purchase intent at the top. As well, I said, uh, here this is another way. So this is this one is an illustration of a hierarchical clustering, so the clustering of clusters. And in 3D, you have this nice representation. This deep learning. Yeah, more or less. This is the same idea. And as I said, this is the idea of, of, of this 3D mapping was, from, at the very beginning, was just this file. So you can export an XML file uh, once you are in this 3D mapping. And then you can do that. So this is with Oculus. So I don't know if you are familiar with that. But then this is something where it's much better because you are inside. Right? So you have these models. And you can directly interact with your model. So you are really touching it. You can use it uh, and really destroy it, if you will. And you can change, so you, you have different options with that. So you have these two, uh, I don't even know the name of these two things, one per hand. Uh, the, the left one is for defining what you want to do with the nodes, and the right one with the, 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 the links. Right? So it should be the, the bigger one. And uh, so here you have 500 nodes. So you, you are just interacting with these companies here, because at the end of the day, these are companies. And so with, uh, you see with my right hand, I'm just defining if I want to see Pearson or Kubak Liber, or if I don't want to have any connection. And with my left one, I can define the size for the bubble. Right? So am I going to use uh, you know, the, the strength of the node or the mean, the normalized mean? So you have all the metrics you have in the 3D mapping and 2D mapping. And you can also use the color. Right, so you can also define the color by using, let's say, the, the expected name. And there is also a tool for searching, because here, uh, when you have 500 nodes like that, if you are looking for a company, uh, it can be tedious. Right? So here you have a tool of the I think I have an example here. I'm using, so the, with the, the, the joystick here, you can just select uh, the company you want. 
and it should be highlighted in, in yellow. And then you can grab the node and analyze who was a neighborhood of or the ecosystem of structure with k nodes. And I think that's it. So you have here, now you have, we have an hour, one hour as a break, so you can obviously have a coffee, grab something to eat, but also you have these two little guys there, Thomas and Marianne, or Marianne and Thomas, and they are so going to help you uh, play with these two. Right? So you will be able to, to interact with him. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.